Please welcome to the S4 main stage, Dale Peterson. Thank you very much. It's really good to see so many familiar faces out there and smiling in the morning. That's great. Welcome to the 2017 edition of Digital Bonds S4. And I just really want to thank you for coming here. I know your time is your most valuable commodity. I really appreciate you coming here for three days, and we're going to try to deliver great value for your time here over the next three days. Now, our theme for this year's S4 is come together. And at the beginning of S4 every year, I stand up here and give a little mini keynote, try to introduce what's going to happen, where I think the ICS security market is. And most years, I look like that. You know, very angry, very frustrated, a little bit depressed. You know, five years ago at S4.12 and S4.13, you know, we had gone through what a lot of us call the lost decade, where we didn't make any progress or any substantial progress on securing our control systems in literally 10 years. We had level one devices, PLCs, RTUs that were insecure by design, and our asset owners were basically stuck with having a good perimeter, keeping the bad guys out, and maybe detecting if they got in, but really not being able to secure their system. And, and you see the other problems there, you know, no SDL. Uh, I think at S4 2012, there were actually 50 different zero days. And we had a lot of brilliant researchers there, but it wasn't because they did brilliant work, it was just because the stuff was so bad. And I think the most frustrating thing to me back five years ago, and why I was so pessimistic, is the ICS security community seemed to accept this. You know, that this was the way it is, get over it, it's gonna be this way for the next 10 or 15 years. So it was, it was not, uh, I guess it was a time for me to vent when I came on stage five years ago. Whereas now, I'm completely optimistic. It's all rainbows and unicorns and sunshine and, and everything is really great. And there's a lot of good reasons for this optimism. I mean, most important, and you know this is my hot button, but we're finally getting rid of insecure by design. We had a panel session at S4 Europe in Vienna last June with a lot of the major PLC and RTU vendors and believe it or not, they're adding things like signed firmware, secure boot, even secure ICS protocols with authentication and authorization enforced at the PLC. So this is just a huge step and really brings us two main things. First of all, if you're an asset owner, you now have a choice. You can decide what is my risk today? Should I spend the money to upgrade to this new secure system to reduce my risk? Before you didn't have a choice, you had to live with it because they were all that way. Now you have a choice. And secondly, we can stop digging this hole. You know, we're, we're, even over the last 15 years, we've been putting in brand new systems that were insecure by design. Now we can put in secure systems. So this is really good. And, and that's, I think, the most important thing. But you see up on the list there, on the slide, a lot of other things. For example, training. Uh, we now have training programs. I know Mike Asante from SANS is speaking this morning. SANS can train thousands of people now in ICS security, as can ISA. Um, some of the more boutique trainers, like Joel Langell, who's speaking this afternoon on the sponsor stage, um, you know, before he could only teach 30 students at a time. Now we have online training from Joel and others that can teach thousands. So we have better training. We have people understanding that security is more than just buying equipment. You see things like the NIST cybersecurity framework or Ralph Langner's OT security framework where you're actually looking at putting together a whole program instead of just buying a widget. And Really, I could go on and on a lot about the last bullet, but we're in a very exciting time, not only from security, but what you're going to see in the next generation of ICS. So this is a, a fantastic time. I think actually the best time to be in ICS security, and I would even broaden that. It's, it's a great time to be in the ICS community as a whole. So 
we are at this time with all this possibility now where the, the technology and the will is coming around to actually do the right thing and to build more secure and reliable and efficient and better control systems. And the way we, what we need to do to take advantage of that is we need some groups that typically don't talk to each other to come together to work on this problem. If we don't do that, we're actually going to lose our opportunity that we have right now. And there's three different groups that I, I want to just touch on briefly that need to come together. Now, the first one, OT and IT. You know, I always say this is an advanced audience. You don't need SCADA SEC 101. You have all heard this for a long time, that OT and IT need to get together. Um, the good news is it's happening. I mean, there are many success stories with companies of different sizes, medium and large companies, where this has already happened. It's a done deal. They're doing it. And there's a variety of ways to solve this problem. But there's a few things I think that you know, I wanted to just highlight shortly that people don't understand that seem to be getting in the way of this. The first thing is, a lot of times, OT, when they say, we can't work with IT, they're thinking of desktop management. And you're right, OT and desktop management should never get together. You, know, you do not want to manage your control system like you manage your 1,000 user desktops or 10,000 user desktops. But when you think of it, and if you have any experience working with mission-critical IT, the type of system where if it's down for 10 seconds, the company can say, we lose this much money, that is almost identical in terms of how you, how you install and maintain an OT system and how you install and maintain a mission-critical IT system. And I know in the audience, because I know a lot of you, we have some even skeptics still about the need for OT and IT to get together. Even if you are a skeptic and you say, IT should stay completely away from OT, you still need IT. You just need the IT skills. So somehow we have to bring the IT skills to this equation. We made the mistake in past years when people were installing Active Directory without domain admins, people were running managed switches with no idea how to actually manage them. The world's getting much more complicated now. Your next control system or the one you put in the last couple of years is going to be running on a virtualized platform. You are going to need people with those IT skills on how to install and maintain a virtual environment or you will fail. Uh, same thing with storage area networks, cloud services. So there's no getting around it. If, even if you want to keep OT separate, you need IT. You're just going to be building your own IT department. Now, the real reason, I think, why OT has been so hesitant to get involved with IT is that OT has basically been a pile of crap. I mean, you, you know, it, it was nothing that IT could do. I mean, 10-year-old operating systems, you know, hubs instead of switches, no one understanding anything about management. It was installed incorrectly. It hasn't been maintained for a decade. There really was not much you could do to come together. Now, fortunately, um, especially the people in this room that I think are more forward-thinking asset owners, but I think across the board we're seeing this change. So you're seeing most of the systems now, either today or in the next five years, will be new systems that can be supported. Now, I've been kind of hard on OT. Uh, IT is also going to need to step up. I'm sure you've run into the situation where IT says, well, we do support 9 to, nine to 6 Monday through Friday. You know, they can't work with OT if they have those requirements. And it, it is a fact that a lot, of, a lot of these companies that have control systems are not used to running mission-critical IT. So they don't actually have the experience on how to do it. They are going to need to step up and understand how they can provide the services needed. Uh, of course, there's, there's culture, there's language, there's what's important to an ICS. There is some learning involved. But I actually think the biggest thing beyond understanding that these are mission-critical systems that require different than desktop management, I think the biggest thing is, is respect. 
a lot of times, if you're, and I know we have some people coming from the IT world, you go into OT and you see this old stuff that's main, not maintained and you think, these people are really stupid. They have no idea what they're doing. They're incompetent. But what they don't realize is that actually putting together and making a, a control system work, uh, the number of points, the displays, the complexity, all the things that have to be built in to allow a couple of operators in a control room to manage a factory or a huge process is truly amazing. It's actually much, much harder than anything in IT or IT security. So we're talking about smart people that need to be treated with respect, and I think what you just have to realize if you're coming at it from that side is that these people that went to school to be electrical engineers or chemical engineers really didn't do, want to do patching of servers or workstations. So the OT and IT one coming together, I think that is well understood. I hope that's a little flavor as to how we can be more effective there. The next two, though, are a little different. So the next two pair that needs to come together is operations and senior management, whether it be your board of directors or your C-level people. I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with a gentleman by the name of Peter Thiel. He was one of the PayPal co-founders. He has a really interesting question. He said, tell me something that's true that almost nobody agrees with you on. It's actually a fun question to ask someone sometime or to think about yourself. You know, what, do you, what are you absolutely convinced is true that everyone else thinks you're crazy? My answer for the last two years is that the board of directors and the C-levels are ready and willing to spend substantial money on ICS security. I contend that getting budget to improve the security and reliability of your ICS is not an issue at the board or C-level right now. The reason I say that, and we have a lot of data points on this, but believe it or not, over the last two years, we've been having to slow down senior management. They want to spend more money than can, than can be effectively spent. They want everything fixed in three months. Once they learn about how bad it is and what risk they had unknowingly accepted, they say, how do we fix this? What is it going to cost? How do we do it? Who can we get? And of course, you can only implement so much change at a time. I'm sure some of you have been involved in safety programs. It's, it's like that. You can't just throw unlimited resources and accomplish it in three months. But that's a very positive indicator. Uh, when you talk to them, they understand risk, and, and they actually understand that the money we're talking about is relatively small compared to the risk that they're accepting and compared to the things that they spend uh, on their other budgeted items. And I guess one thing I like to do, if you, if you really run into a problem with this, is pull out the list of the funded projects in IT and look at what they're funding and how much money they're spending. And then look at the criticality of the control system. I mean, most of these companies, they are in business to produce a product, to deliver water, to, to refine oil. You know, the control system is the reason they exist. And yet, the idea that they wouldn't spend a certain amount of money on these systems as opposed to putting, you know, upgrading, let's say, their intranet server that provides their benefits to the employees is just laughable. It is a really easy sell at the right level. Now, the challenge when I say come together is the plant managers, and I know we have some out there, and the VP of operations, as well as the subject matter experts who advise them, they really need to step up. They need to be bringing the case to these high-level executives as to why we need to spend this money, what risk we currently have, how we will reduce that risk. And this is very new because they're typically used to adding or coming up to the board or the C-levels every 15, 20 years, asking for a big capital expenditure to put in a new system, and then going away and saying, you know, we won't, we won't bother you, you won't bother us, just leave us alone for 15, 20 years. Okay, that's changed. And if you are the, a plant manager, it's a little bit embarrassing to go to your bosses and say, uh, by the way, we have this huge risk that we haven't addressed for years and we need to spend this money now. 
It's, it's a little bit embarrassing. But I think you can handle that because it's a problem across the industry and if they talk to their peers, they'll see this is an issue everyone's dealing with. And it, it really is better than the alternative. The alternative, if you as a plant manager don't initiate this coming together, is that the board or the sea levels are somehow gonna learn of the risk that you have not told them about, that you are accepting, and it is not going to be a career-enhancing activity for you. And I, I have two examples up there. One, we had a, um, a food and beverage company that just was, you know, they were one of the ones going as fast as they could to do as much as they could uh, because it was pushed. And I asked, well, why, you know, what caused this? And I'm sure we, we have some consultants out there. Usually it's one of two things. Either there's been an incident and they're, they're all of a sudden reacting to the incident, or someone got religion. And in this case, the food and beverage COO happened to be at an event, it, it wasn't S4, but he happened to be at an event and sat next to the Coca-Cola COO. And the Coca-Cola COO said, oh, this is what we're doing, and here's the risks we have, and, and we're, you know, we put this program together. And then our client went back to his company and started asking questions and got some really ugly answers. So you don't want that to happen. You want to bring the issues up rather than have them push down. The other example is, is pretty similar. Um, you, you probably recognize that's the front page to a Chatham House report. Uh, a board member of an electric utility client read that, passed it out, passed the executive summary to all the other board levels, board members, all the C-level executives, and all of a sudden the same thing happened. They started asking questions. They were, uh, I don't think horrified is that strong, but they were very concerned uh, about the risk that they had, and they, you know, they went flat out to try to address it. So you want to, again, you want to push the, the VP of ops, the plant manager, you want to initiate the coming together, because it's going to happen either way, and you want to control that. Now, the third area and final area I want to talk about coming together really has a lot to do here with what you're going to see on the main stage over the next couple of days. And that is our ICS community needs to bring in related fields. Now, you could, you could say IT is a related field, but there's a lot more that we need to consider, and I just put some of them up on this list. Uh, machine learning is going to have a dramatic impact on control systems over the next five years. We need to understand it. We need to incorporate it into our strategies. We have a great session on Thursday morning with uh, Catherine Hume from Fast Forward Labs that is just gonna blow your mind. I mean, it is amazing what we're gonna be doing with machine learning. And the same thing with cloud services. Of course, there's risk to these, so we need to find the right way to do them, how to use this technology, how to use it securely and reliably, and I actually have a session Thursday afternoon um, on, on how we can uh, an approach to that. Psychology, related field, how would that apply? We have a great talk from a uh, clinical psychologist, Dr. Eric Shaw, who used to work in an intelligence agency. And you know one of the problems you always hear about disgruntled insiders being the toughest ones, they're the ones that can hurt you most and it's very difficult to find them. You can use clinical psychology, statistics, and email to proactively identify disgruntled insiders. And the numbers are amazing. And, and it's not theoretical, it's actually happening. Uh, conflict theory to understand your threat environment. We have Dick Clark keynoting on Thursday. Uh, we have uh, a woman, um, Renee Turin from NSA and Mary McCord coming up from the Department of Justice. Uh, we added Ben Buchanan. Uh, he's speaking later today and in do a book signing at the Cabana sessions. But you'll get a lot of information on how to think about threat, how to understand how cyber weapons will be used and defended against, and, and whether you like the term or not, how cyber warfare will take place. And we have economics and a variety of other things. So we really want to embrace these related fields. Bring in the best people, understand what they are, figure out how we can use them, and bring them in sensibly 
into the ICS world. Now, this, this audience here, a lot of you, we don't have every leader in ICS and ICS security here, but we have a lot of them. I mean, this is a very good representation. And I, I, I went through this in the crypto world back a couple of decades ago, too long ago, where you have a group where maybe there's 100 to 500 people and everyone knows everyone. And to a certain extent, sometimes people like it that way. It's like, well, we're, we're the ones that know it. You outsiders stay out. And, and there can be a tendency to be a little petty about who knows what or insular and not let others in. Uh, I think we really have to work hard to avoid that. You know, we need to encourage people not only to come into ICS security proper, but to bring knowledge from related fields in. We need to open their arms and, and bring that knowledge into ICS security. And my hope here at S4, the next three days, is we can play some small part on that. We have three stages going on. So you have the main stage where you'll have advanced sessions, but not deep technical sessions for the most part, um, on ICS and related fields. We have stage two, which has the gory technical stuff. And I, I've seen the presentations. They, they brought it this year. There's a lot of technical details. If you want it, you'll see it on stage two. And then we have the sponsor stage. We moved the, for those of you who were here last year, we moved the sponsor stage to right, right on the first floor, right when you walked into the place. The sponsor stage is right there. And we challenged the sponsors this year. We said, look, you know, they, a lot of times they asked, well, how many people will come to our session? How many people should we expect? And said, well, it depends how good your session is, right? I mean, there's, there's two other stages going on. They have choices. You need to bring it or you're going to have an empty room. I, I'm proud to say that the sponsors really stepped up this year. Um, you have people that are keynoters speaking on the sponsor stage. You have very technical talks on the sponsor stage. And I'd encourage you to definitely check out that agenda as well as stage two and the main stage. So one of, the, one of the ways we're going to get you to come together is we're going to bring you a lot of new information. But probably the more important way is this is a, a really good group of people here. And we want to set up, and we always set up S4 so that you have time to establish and reestablish your relationships with people that you need to be talking to. So. Of course, you have the hallway con, you have after hours in South Beach, which is always fun. But we have a lot of social events where you'll have time to sit down and literally meet almost everyone here. Tonight, uh, after the last session, we go over to the Botanical Gardens, just a short walk, and we have a welcome party. That's going to be really fun. Liz Daly does a great job on the food and entertainment, and she's got some real surprises there. And if you happen to have a, a spouse or a guest, they're welcome to come. And then tomorrow, we have the cabana sessions. And that's really the time um, that a lot of people liked last year, where we set aside the afternoon to enjoy the Miami sun around the pool. And you really have time to interact with your other attendees and the sponsors. And out at the cabana sessions this year, there's, there's some virtual reality. There's robot challenges. Uh, Cisco brought their kegerator, so you can try to hack it to get a beer. Uh, there's augmented reality and, and all sorts of other entertainment and food. So I think you'll really have a good time there, but I also want you to really connect with your fellow attendees. And so with that, I just want to, again, welcome you to S4, and I hope I have a chance to talk to each and every one of you. Thank you very much.